course of my work in evangelization, I often run across this objection. How could an all good God possibly send people to hell? How could a God who's described as infinitely good create, sustain, and send people to a place of infinite, horrible torment? And you find the objection from both believers and non-believers. In fact, a lot of my uh, friends on YouTube have directed my attention to a video done uh, by George Carlin, the comedian, many years ago. Carlin, I suppose, was an ex-Catholic, and he was lampooning the whole idea of hell. And he said, well, you know, for some sin, usually of a sexual nature, God will send you to this place of infinite, horrible, tremendous torment. But then he changes and he says, but of course this God loves you. And of course the people all, you know, burst into hysterical laughter. They can't get enough of it. Um, Now you have to confess, somewhere in your soul you think, well maybe Carlin's got a point. Is there something just inconsistent about this belief in the eternity of hell? Well, I would suggest that we should be very careful about dismissing this doctrine, which has been enunciated by all the great theologians of our tradition and, in fact, goes back to Jesus himself. On the lips of Jesus himself, we find this language of Gehenna and of the everlasting fire and so on. I would say this. The doctrine of hell is a corollary, a kind of a necessary consequence of two other doctrines, and I doubt anybody wants to deny these other two. Namely, that God is love and that we human beings are free. I think you can't hold those two without also holding the possibility of hell. Now, here's why. Look first at the claim that God is love. We hold not that God has love or that love is one of God's attributes or love is something that God does from time to time. Love is what God is. The whole nature, essence, substance, life of God is love to will the good of the other as other, that's who God is. Therefore, God doesn't go in and out of love, doesn't love some, hate others. He doesn't go into emotional snits and change his mind. God simply is love. In Jesus' language, he's like the sun that shines on the good and the bad alike. There's the idea of the primacy of grace and of God's love, which is all through our tradition. There's the first great teaching. Now here's the second one, that human beings are free. Look, God made uh, planets and plants and animals and insects to glorify him simply by being themselves. That's how they reflect the divine goodness. But human beings he made with intelligence and will. That means he wants us to respond to his love, who he is, with our own love. He gave us that privilege of our freedom. Now the minute you say freedom, you have to say the possibility of the abuse of freedom. That's the nature of freedom, is is I can decide yes or no. I can say yes to the love that God is and thereby find joy and peace and my own deepest purpose, or I can say no to it. I can resist it. What does that cause, that resistance? It causes suffering at the level of the soul, the deepest level. It's like fire. It's like torment. It's like everlasting uh, flames. Why am I using that language? Because it's biblical language to suggest this great spiritual suffering. What is hell? Hell would be that final and definitive no to God's love uttered from the depth of one's soul. That's hell. Eternal suffering, yeah, because it's this eternal no to the love that God is. Now, I think in light of this clarification, we can see how all the language of God sending people to hell, God condemning people to hell because of their um, uh, mistakes and so on, is, is problematic. God doesn't so much send people there. People send themselves into this state by their refusal of the divine love. That's why C.S. Lewis said, I think wonderfully, the door to hell is always locked from the inside. It's not as though God is, is maliciously locking it from the outside, locking people in. Rather, it's people themselves who by their refusal lock themselves away from the divine love. That's what hell would be. 
Lewis also said this, and I think it's really interesting. He said, the love of God lights up the fires of hell. They say, what does that mean? How counterintuitive. But see, love is what God is. That's all God knows how to do. The love of God is always shining on us. But if you turn away from it, it becomes a kind of torture to you because you're meant to respond to it. The very love in which the saint basks in joy is what the sinner suffers in. Think of it this way. Imagine a great party is going on. This exuberant, joyful, riotously fun party is going on. One person is there who is completely surrendered to it. They've given themselves over to the exuberance of the party. They're having the time of their life. And now imagine someone at the same party. They've come into the same party, but they are turned in on themselves in a kind of reproachful um, self-regard, sitting sullenly in the corner. For that person, the very exuberance of the party is a torture. The very exuberance of the party is a source of suffering. We shouldn't talk about God capriciously sending people to hell. We should think of hell this way. If anyone's in it, and by the way, the church is not obliging anyone to believe that a human being is in hell. We just don't know. But if there is anyone in it, it's someone who has absolutely insisted on not attending the party.